so happy to have you. We welcome you. And we ask that you fill out a visitor's card, which is in the back of the pew in front of you. Um, it's just some of your information so that we can stay in contact with you because we're so glad that you are here. I just have a few announcements that I want to emphasize from the Proclaimer. First of all, tonight at 445 in the Sanctuary is the Awana Award Ceremony. And following that, from 6 to 8 in the Ministry Center is the Carnival. It'll be a night of fun and celebration for all that has been accomplished and experienced this year, so please join us tonight. Volunteers are needed for VBS from 9 a.m. to noon, June 17th through the 21st. You can sign up lots of places, the church office, in Sunday school, online, on the app. Um, we've made it as accessible as possible, um, so please sign up and join us that week. Lastly, graduation Sunday is coming up on May 19th. All information needs to be in the office by this Wednesday. So deadline is this Wednesday. And those are all the announcements I have today. And he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's stand together as we worship our God and stand in his presence this morning.
today. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church family and to worship you. God, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, would you move in our midst? God, today, would you communicate to our hearts and to our minds that which we need for this moment? God, we pray that you would take your word and that you would apply it to each circumstance of each individual as appropriate, and God, that you would apply it to our church family as a whole as it is appropriate. And God, we also don't want to be negligent for praying for those who are suffering among us. And God, today, primarily, I pray for the family of Karen Sowers as they come to this sanctuary today at 2 o'clock, and that family uh, memorializes and remembers uh, Karen's life. God, we pray that you would uh, be with them, that you would comfort them, that you would touch them um, and help them through this difficult moment. Uh, God, we also today pray for uh, Carolyn Franklin and as she continues to heal, God, we pray that you would expedite that process, that you would help her along the process, that you would comfort her uh, and that you would uh, allow her body to, to heal. God we, God, we just think about the needs of this congregation and the needs of this community. And so, God, we pray that you would, God, give us hope for so many situations we see around us that seem to be so difficult. And yet, God, we pray that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would give us your wisdom from above. And God, that we would know, especially just with the people that we touch, with the situations that we encounter, God, that you'd give us our responsibility and that we would be faithful under your, uh, under your Lordship to do that which you call us to do and that we'd be faithful to do what you call us as a church to do. And so, God, impress upon our hearts that which you desire of us today. May we commune with you, meet with you, and know that you are with us, that you, uh, that you are here, and that your spirit will be felt in this place even this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
What a wonderful promise to know that in the new heavens and the new earth, it will all, will all become one, and God will reign over his world forever. Let's stand as we sing about our Father's word. Father, we are join our hearts together now in, in praise for your great love and your great mercy towards us. We praise you for the life and the hope that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we pray, our God, that, uh, that as you build your love in us, uh, that you work in and through us to that many, Heavenly Father, as we give ourselves up to you, that many might be uh, able to see you and turn our hearts towards you and trust you. And so, our Father, we, um, we just ask you to bless all that we give to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.
when you start talking about the new heaven and the new earth, all of a sudden, God's present creation comes into view. Have you not noticed that in the music today? Well, today I conclude this second part of a two-part series entitled A New Heaven and a New Earth. The goal of this series really is to attempt to unpack some of the basic implications of Easter Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus. My concern is, 
Easter flashes on the scene, we herald Jesus is alive, and then we quickly move to Mother's Day, graduation Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, summer vacation. That is the way it goes, and we're kind of left hanging, wondering, Jesus is alive, now let's go on summer vacation. That is unfortunately the way it happens. And yet the Bible is so clear to us that Jesus' resurrection is the first fruit. It is the first of many. It is an event that anticipates a host of other events, those of which I would propose are potentially as glorious are potentially more glorious than even the resurrection of Jesus. It is important that if you do not understand how a book ends, then you do not really understand all the plot moves that lead up to this moment. And the large message of the Bible is creation, fall, redemption, restoration. We ultimately end with God subsuming all things under Christ, under his lordship, to every knee bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I am afraid that while we've gotten Christmas right and Easter right, this final drama, the end of the story, the wrap-up of human history, all things under Christ, is very fuzzy. Now, it has not been fuzzy for every generation leading up to this. Quite frankly, for most faithful Christians, this was not something that was ambiguous in a world of toil, in a world of suffering, where we could not amuse ourselves to death. Christians had to think there has to be more beyond this world, for if there's not, this world means very little. And yet in our day, what can happen? We can recreate, we can activity ourselves, and we can even delude ourselves to what many philosophers of our day calls we lock ourselves in an imminent frame. We live as if today is all that there is and all that there will be, and whammo, death happens and we don't know what to do with it. It shocks us, it terrifies us, we minimize it, and we move on. That's not the way the Bible talks about it. The Bible says we live this life to the fullest, die in the faith, rise again, and look forward to all that God has. And so in some ways, I'm trying to shake us. Sometimes we're so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. I'm afraid we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. And so we might ought to reverse the paradigm a bit and say, what about this life will matter eternally? And to get that vision in view. Now, I want to talk primarily about the new heaven and the new earth. But I want to set a lot of this in a larger context. Actually, your view of the future will ultimately be preached at your funeral. That's where it will be. Uh, that's where things get personal. I cannot restate everything that I stated last week. This, I'm giving 12 large points, 6 last week, 6 this week. So I apologize for the inability, but the great news is the last six points are on the internet. You can watch all six of them to bring them up to today. I do restate this. Many people ask me the basic question, what happens at death? I put this chart up last week, I put it up again. So if you are a Christian, unless the Lord returns, you will die. Unfortunately, 100% of all humans outside of Jesus, who was the God-man, well, he died but rose again. So 100% of people have died and remain dead. Nevertheless, you say, well, what happens at death? Well, Christians have historically believed. Nothing that I'm saying is aberrant, fringe, marginal. This would actually cross all major Protestant denominations, and I would actually have a lot in common with even the larger view of the Christian church. So nothing I'm saying is some marginalized view. It's not at all. So Christians have historically believed a two-step process after death. When you die, your body goes to the ground, your spirit goes to God. It is absolutely true to say 
As a Christian, you go to heaven when you die. Absent from the body, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, present with the Lord. You say, well, what is that like? How is, it, how is it to be disembodied or to have a spirit body or to have a temporary body? Honestly, we just don't know. When people ask me, as one person did this week, where are the Christian dead? How is this like? I honestly shrug my shoulders and say, they're with the Lord and they are in a better place. This is not what the Bible focuses on. The Bible focuses on the ultimate hope because the Bible states, 1 Thessalonians 4, that when the Lord returns, the dead in Christ will rise first and then those of us who are alive and remain will rise, get a new body at that particular time. So we still have resurrection there is a final judgment, and actually today there's not only a judgment for unbelievers towards condemnation, there is a judgment for believers. I'll actually briefly touch on that today, but once it's all wrapped up, we get new heaven and new earth. So, there is a lot more living to do after dying as a Christian, um, and everything after the grave uh, is better for me to live as Christ, Paul says, First Philippians 1.21, to die is gain. And yet, at the end of the Bible, you get one and a half chapters. Now, quite frankly, you get more than this. Because most of the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, envisioned what John envisions in Revelation 21 and 22. But you get this grand vision of a new heaven and a new earth. Ultimately... It's a new heaven and a new earth because now God and man are together and heaven, the place where God resides and earth, the place where man resides is now put back together again. I hope you heard it in the, the hymn you just sung, Jesus who died will be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. That hymn writer got it exactly right. So we pick up now where we left off. There are three major symbols that articulate Revelation 21 and 22. These three symbols of new heaven, new earth are new garden, new temple, and new Jerusalem. I ended last week saying that John envisioned a city. A garden city was the vision that he had, one in which God resided and the effects of sin were eradicated. Now I'm going to read a long text for you, so if you have your Bible, Revelation 21, verse 9, all the way through 22, 5. I feel like while I can explain it, you ought to hear it from the Bible first. So I read this longer text to you, and then I try to unpack it in six statements. Starting in verse 9 of Revelation 21, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like very precious stone, like jasper stone, bright as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with twelve gates. Twelve angels were at the gates. On the gates, names were inscribed, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. The city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the Lamb's twelve apostles. Then the one spoke with me, had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured the wall, 144 cubics according to human measurement, which the angel used. The building materials of its wall would was jasper, and the city was pure like clear glass. The foundation of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, carnelian. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysophase. The eleventh, jacinth. The twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates are twelve pearls, each individual gate made of a single pearl. The broad street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. 
I did not see a sanctuary in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations walk in its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close because there will never be night there. They will bring the glory of and honor of the nations into it. Nothing profane will ever in it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the broad street of the city, on every side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. Night will exist no longer, and the people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. There is the vision, at least the second part of it. Let me give you six final statements that tie this all together. Again, the goal today is not to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, but to be heavenly minded enough that we're actually earthly good for something, at least in God's economy. Here is the first major point out of this. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to understand, but I promise you there are things we should be able to get our hands around. Not everything, but some things. The first thing, God will create a new earth in which the effects of the fall of humanity are absent. Revelation 20, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. I didn't read that today. And God will restore the world to an Eden-like paradise. In many ways, the last things are the first things in the Bible. The Bible in some ways ends where it begins. And if so, if you don't understand how it starts... Well, you don't understand how it ends. And I put up these artistic renderings. Please do not take them overly literally. But I attempt to show you what some artists have attempted to capture when they attempt to capture these visions. So we ought to envision God's new world as a new Eden-like paradise. I answer a lot of questions today that I've gotten. First of all, we notice situated right in the middle of this new Eden-like paradise is the tree of life. In Genesis 1, we get, and 2, we get the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God sets a tree in the midst of the garden to test Adam and Eve to see if they will follow him or not. That tree had a consequence. The tree of life does not. It is as if God has removed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and now replaced it with the tree of life, one that will give God's life perpetually to his creation. Every garden not only needs a tree, it needs a river. And here we have the, the, the living water, the water of life flowing from the throne of God. Again, what we notice is even when the Bible talks about the garden, it talks about the garden around the throne of God. So it's not like a garden way somewhere else and we don't know where the rest of civilization is. It is as if God's garden-like world is in the midst of everything else, thus the idea of a garden city. No doubt, if we read Revelation, uh, Romans chapter 8 carefully, the Bible makes it abundantly clear, and I made this statement last week, that we are not looking for something wholly different than the world that we have. Uh, God created this world, and the message of the Bible is not going, oh, well, so much for that. You know, that fell apart. We'll just have to do something else now. That's not at all the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is one of redemption. It's one of buying you back and Romans 8, 21, that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. And nevertheless, while things are the same, they're different. There is an enhancement. There is a different quality on top of the same quality. One of the qualities that we see is that there is no sun and there is no night. One of the things we know about our own world is that it is set towards decay. 
Even scientists say, well, in X amount of time, the sun will go. Uh, it won't last forever. And yet in God's new world, there won't be a sun nor a moon. It says, for God himself will be the light. A few other statements you heard even in the chorus, something that troubled people about the new garden is it says, Revelation 20, 21, 1, and there's no more sea. Maybe that's the reason everyone's rushing to the beach. They're thinking we better get our beach trips in uh, because the sea is gone. Now, may I say something? The book of Revelation is highly symbolic. There's no doubt about it. However, even symbols communicate truths, by the way. And I would generally say if the plain sense makes sense, don't seek another sense lest you end up in nonsense, you know, and that's happened too. So you have to be careful. However, the sea in the book of Revelation, you people ask, well, you think there's going to be a sea? The simple answer is, I don't know. And here's the reason. Because in the book of Revelation, when the sea is mentioned, it typically does not mean a body of water. Uh, the sea is used symbolically all through the book of Revelation. It is the origin of evil, the sea of humanity. Uh, the unbelieving and rebellious nations are described as a sea. The place of the sea is a place where the dead are, and the sea gave up their dead. The sea is a place of the idolatrous trade of the nations that God will stamp out because of their idolatry. And so when the Bible says there's no more sea, it means the place of evil, the rebellious nations, the, the place of the dead, and the place of idolatrous commerce will be over. And I think that's the major point. So you might have a sea, I just don't know, so that might lower your desire to go to the beach. You might get one eternally, I just don't know. But we do know that. Another question that comes up quite a bit, people say, when God makes this new earth, what about animals? I'm always a little dumbfounded by the answers that I hear from ministers. Uh, do, will, there, will God, when he recreates the world, will he have animals in it? And my answer seems to be a resounding yes. Uh, and here's the reason. I don't have enough time to talk about everything, but just in the previous chapter, there's a previous event before final judgment where the world begins to change. The Bible calls this the millennium, and we know these classic images. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The child will play over the snake's den and not be harmed on God's holy mountain. The prophets are full of this. And so when God remade, we already are beginning to see in the prophets, God reordering the animal world to be violence free, to be not harmful. And thus, wouldn't it be the case that God in his new world would then provide for us uh, animals to enjoy. It seems to be the case. If he's doing all the rest, why not that? Others will then say to me, well, wait a minute. If we're going back to a garden, then well, won't we start the drama all over again? I hear this question. No, that's not the case. Uh, because many people think that freedom, listen, is freedom to sin. But my, the Bible says that ultimate freedom is not freedom to sin. Ultimate freedom is freedom from sin. When God gets rid of the whole thing. Uh, when you don't have to deal with this anymore. And so when God makes all things new. Yes, he created us for a time. To have a decision to be rebellious. To go against our very nature. To rebel against our creator. But at the end of all things. We will not experience the freedom to sin. But we will finally and gloriously experience real freedom. Which is freedom from sin. And thus I would appreciate that even in this particular moment. One other statement about the new garden. Before I move to other images. It says in Revelation 22, if you read it, it says, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. One of the glories, and I'll unpack this in a moment, but I hint at it now. One of the glories of God's new world is that it will not just merely forget and blot out all the struggle of this world. That's not the way it works. 
You say, how do you know this? Because the glory of God's new creation will be that it will in many ways redeem and restore all the wounds of the world. That is the case. You say, well, how do you know this? Well, even the wounds of Jesus, His nail-scarred hands, were at one moment were a sign of human evil have become the very badge of God's glory. And so it's not as if the suffering will be jettisoned and marginalized. In some ways, it will be ultimately redeemed. And honestly, at this moment, I really like to lean into Christian artists. Uh, there's a beautiful sculpture called the Tree of Life. And it's a beautifully, it's a sparkling large tree. And yet the tree is made out of gun parts from World War II. It's almost as if these objects of war have now been made into this beautiful sculpture. I think the Christian artists are actually capturing this vision of what God might ultimately do. It will not be pain forgotten. It will be pain redeemed. And that is the idea. The second point is that God will create a new earth in which the entire world is his temple. Thus, the temple will not be marked off in a specific place, but all of God's glory and presence will fill the earth. You get this startling statement in Revelation 21, 22, and I did not see a temple. And honestly, throughout the Bible, what you get in the Old Testament, the first place God says, look, we've got to get back together again. And how does God get back together even with Old Testament Israel? He says there's this one little room called the Holy of Holies and the priest gets a full encounter with me one time a year in one little place. It's almost as if heaven and earth, God and man, for this, in this place of sacrifice, they get back together for a moment. So in one very interesting way, while there is no temple you understand, the function of what the temple was to bring God and man back together again is now everywhere. That's the idea. You don't have to go to God in some way. He is now present and available. Full communion is everywhere with God. That's the idea. There's no place you must go For he is in every place as fully as he was in any one place in times past. The glory of the new heaven and new earth is God is there. And God is there not hidden behind a veil. He is there full out for us to experience. I think the language of communion is really the essence of what it means. There's no temple because God is here. He is available we notice that even human relationships begin to change. And in some ways, we anticipate this change even in the present. When Jesus is particularly asked about this question, Revelation 22, 30, Jesus says, at the resurrection, looking at the end, he says, we will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Now, the question is, will I remember who I married? Yes, I can't imagine that you won't. You say, what if I married six people? Don't do that. Uh, you know, uh, but, but nevertheless, if you have, well, let me just say that. If you have, the restoration will be absolute. The forgiveness will be absolute. And God will begin to put us all back together The reason we will not be married is because we will all finally and completely be part of God's family. The communion that you could potentially have with a spouse, that you could potentially have with a good friend, you'll have with all of God's people. That's the idea, that this rich and deep communion will be felt among all people. And that even in the body of Christ, even the Bible, it says, treat old men like fathers and old women like mothers and young women like sisters and young men like brothers. What is the Bible trying to do? Anticipate the God's family that's happening. And even the best analogy for the church is the family of God. We are to, even in this moment, be anticipating this full and complete family that God will ultimately give us 
at the end of time. What a joy that will be. The hope of not only seeing your family, but getting a wide new family. Jesus says, quite frankly, even if you have to be estranged from your mothers and brothers, you'll get new mothers and brothers and fathers and mothers in this world, in my family. That was his point. The third major point that we see here is that God will create a new Jerusalem. The bulk of the text I read that you probably glazed over about gem number seven, uh, but this is the big image. While the language of a new Jerusalem is highly symbolic, I'll try to point out the symbolism, it certainly references the safety and security of God's people. Now, I want to notice, I put this, it is a cube city. That's the way. If you notice, we actually get measurements. Now, the measurements are hard to measure, just to be honest. But you say, what is being communicated in this cube city? Well, one of the things that we note, there is one other place that's built in a cube in the Bible. Guess where it is? The inner room of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. That's built in a cube. It's a squared cube room. Uh, and the point is... The place in which in the Old Testament God dwelled in greatest holiness, now that's coming down out of heaven to reside on the earth. So it's not a symbol devoid from meaning, but it's not full literalism either. Further, you say, what about all these stones that are mentioned? It is the, the Old Testament priest would wear stones on his chest in his garment, and these stones are now reflective. The, bo the bottom line is, what does this communicate? That God's new world, listen carefully, will not just be a new garden. It truly will be a garden city. It will not only have the beauty of the world, it seems to also have the beauty of craftsmanship, the beauty of building, the beauty of something more than just trees and lakes and creeks. It has something more to it. The idea, it conjures up, and now we focus on this, it conjures up that there will be society in this world. Notice, what does it mean that Christ will reign? If he reigns, he must reign over a people. He must reign over a place. He must reign eternally. What does this mean? Which brings me to my fourth point. God will create a new Jerusalem, which seems to imply that the new earth was not merely a return to an Eden-like existence, but rather it's a greater than Eden. You understand? We're not just turning back the clock. We are looking to God's ultimate future, uh, which seems to imply that the new earth was not merely a return to an Eden-like existence, but rather the culmination of all human history under Christ and his kingdom. Further, the language of New Jerusalem conjures up visions of a city, civilization, and even government. The good news is Jesus will be on the throne and nobody else. Uh, so that will, is a great need. I want to read a few texts for you just to point this out. Um, look at Revelation 21. Uh, notice, this is what I'm saying. It's not as though things of the past have been forgotten. It's the things of the past are being remembered. Notice, it says the city had massive high walls with 12 gates. 12 angels on, were at the gates. And notice, on the gates, names were inscribed, the names of 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So it's like, well, we remember that episode of God's history. Then verse 14, the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the Lamb's apostles, those apostles that some of which we know nothing about. Thaddeus, he gets his name on there. We know like zero about him other than his name. And then verse 24, the nations will walk in its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Notice Revelation eleven fifteen, and maybe you notice that this has been picked up elsewhere. The kings of the world, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Notice we get this sense there are names on the gates, and, and, and there are things about this world that are remembered. Thus, notice, there are the, 
I, I'm pretty confident. I want to briefly talk about cradle, cross, and crown. We got the Christmas message. Jesus is born in a manger. You were just on the slide. Do it. Uh, Jesus was born in a manger. We got that one. Cross resurrection. Yes. But the final drama is that sweet baby Jesus, the Messiah who dies for us and rises again, will one day reign. That is its cradle, cross, crown. If you read Philippians 2 correctly, after the, we, we get the first section. Let this mind be in you, also in Christ Jesus, being in the very form of God. He humbled himself to the death on the cross. But what is the end of that? That therefore God has now exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When does this happen? New heavens and new earth is when it happens. And you say, has this really moved people? Sometimes we're moved and we don't even know we're moved. At Christmas time, we sing one of our best songs, outside of Joy to the World, which I'm not going to talk about, okay, talks about Christ reigning. And we're thinking, sweet baby Jesus. No, no. That he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glory of his righteousness and wonders of his love. And he will reign as far as the curse is found. That's the, so you screw up the whole thing. You see, you didn't even know what you, you're at the cross talking about the cr cradle. But our, one of our famous songs we sing at Christmas, the Hallelujah Chorus, Handel's Messiah. Listen to the words. You're talking about this final drama. And it moves people when it's sung. And I don't think they know why it moves them. Because it conjures up within them this deep, this, and listen to these words. The kingdom, and the, you know, I mean, I sing this every year. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it now. Uh, but, but, this, but there's this strong, it says, the kingdoms of this world ha is become. The kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And then, then he's, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Ba -ba -bum -bum, ba -ba -bum -bum. And then, okay, this, but why does this move you? Why does it move you? Because it conjures up this final drama. Yes. You know, why do you stand at the hallelujah chorus? Why does everybody, how do you it? Everybody stands up. There's a unsubstantiated story. It's probably not true. We don't know. But it, it, is, it was stated that King George II, the big guy, when he heard the Hallelujah Chorus and heard about the reign of Christ, he was so moved, he stood to his feet. And when the king stands, you stand. I can guarantee you that. So everybody stands. And whether that story is true or false, the Bible says one day the kings of the earth will stand. And he, the Lord God omnipotent will reign. And there will be one day a full and complete hallelujah chorus. Oh, I must press on. Um, the fifth point. Um, this is not just a return to the past. You see this. This is a culmination of all things under Christ. God will create a new earth in which it appears that the righteous lives of believers are remembered and earthly labor done for Christ's kingdom will be rewarded. And I am so out of time, but I will try to, I will complete my sermon in short order. I do want you to get this. This is worth, I, I, by the way, I'm very conscious of your time and I won't do this. Next Sunday, my sermon is going to be so short on Mother's Day, it's going to make you hurt. Um, <laughs> Because we got 13 babies to dedicate. So um, I, do want, I do want to point this out. I want to read 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Because here's my concern. We, we understand why we have faith. But most people have no clue why what we do for Christ actually matters. By the way, there is a judgment, listen carefully, for believers. Not a, not a judgment to see if you're saved or lost. A judgment of what you actually did. This has been so, just somehow got lost in the shuffle, but it's clearly there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, verse 15. Listen to this. It says, because no one can lay any other foundation than that which has been laid, that is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Now notice this. Each one's 
each one's work will become obvious for the day. The day of judgment will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, the fire will test the quality of each one's work. And let me show you, this is clearly about Christians. It says, if anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, the work, but he will be saved. So it's clearly about a Christian. Yet it will be like an escape through the fire. He'll have faith in Christ, but not one scintilla of work for Christ done. By the way, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, again communicates this same message. The longest chapter in the Bible on the resurrection. And you know what it says? Because of the resurrection, therefore, dear brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. Guess why? Knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Something about resurrection affects our works. Or do you need to hear it from Jesus? Matthew chapter 6. I just preached this. And most people are like, yeah, I don't know what that actually means, but it sounds good. Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Jesus makes it about as plain as you can make it. Do not collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. Where are we supposed to put them? Give them to God for all eternity so they can be remembered, so they can be rewarded. Send them on to heaven. That's Jesus' message. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves break through and steal. And Jesus says by sending them on ahead, it focuses you in the present and gets your heart in the right condition. Now you say, well, how, okay, how in the world does this work? We do know one thing. How were the works of the 12 tribes of Israel and the apostles remembered? Their names were on the gates. I mean, even in this world, you have to, and even in churches, people want to do something and they want to put a plaque on it. Well, it appears, to my chagrin, that God might put a few plaques around the new heavens and new earth. I mean, I don't know what else to say, because here they are. Now, Imagine with me for a moment. So I have now worked at Liberty Baptist 15 years. I've worked in this area. Sometimes out of right motivations and other times probably not, just to be honest. But when God makes his creation new, which has to mean Appomattox, because it's part of his creation, when God finally does his renovation, let's just say right now, I am preaching to the glory of God out of a heart for love for you to communicate the truthfulness. Will God in some way remember my work here eternally? I think the Bible has to say a resounding yes. Yes. It has to be. So then I have to start imagining. And again, you'll have to just bear with me on my analogy I'm about to give you. But now listen, can we envision a place in which the story of the nation is told in a place? And I can only think, just bear with me, of one place in, our, in the world that we know it's our nation's capital. You walk around Washington, D.C., and what does the place tell you about? The Vietnam conflict, the World War II conflict, all the civil rights movements. And you walk around the place, and it tells you about every episode of the nation. Why America came to be, who were the movers and the shakers, who stood against the test of time, who did this, who did that, right? That's what the function of the city is in this very small place to communicate something much bigger than the place itself. Now, praise God, the new heavens and new earth will not be Washington, D.C., but could it be a place, but could it be a place where the righteous lives of believers are remembered and rewarded. I cannot, um, I can't, we already get visions of a city. We already get lives remembered. And so people say, well, here's the deal. What you're doing right now won't matter 15 years from now, probably. 
It certainly won't matter in a hundred for earthly terms unless you really do something and give it 1,500 and nobody will remember your name. I can, if you really believe that that which you do for Christ in his kingdom matters eternally, it does not make you so heavenly minded. You're no earthly good. It focuses you for earthly good against all odds like nothing else. Which leads me to my final point. In this world, we live as sojourners and exiles. In some ways, this world is not our home, and in other ways, this world will be our home once God is done. Who seek a city that is to come, whose designer and builder is God. Even though we realize that God's ultimate work will be done on earth, we pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven in the present moment. At the heart of the Lord's prayer is really the prayer for the new heaven and new earth. And the prayer for anticipation. God, until you make all things new. God, until you do what you're ultimately going to do, may in my life and in my work, may I already be operating under your kingship and under your priorities. I hope you understand this. And you say, what has this done to Christian saints? Well, what it can do is liberate you. That you won't seek transient, feeble positions in this world. You won't say, how can I be, become part of the kingdoms of this earth? That's not what you're going to say. How can I participate in God's ultimate kingdom activity? And what that can liberate you to do is not to seek to be the highest, but to be just perfectly fine to be the lowest, to serve the lowest, to work in the places where sin has done its greatest work and nobody else, quite frankly, wants to touch it. And you can go in there and pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done right here in this situation, in this life, in this community, in this church, in this person. God, make it come. And you say, well, what if they die in failure? You realize that one day it's not all up to you and your work. I will die one day and Liberty Baptist Church will still be full of its own problems. I'm going to try to fix a lot of them, you know. I'm going to be honest. I'm serious. I wake up every morning thinking, how can I take care of God's church? But I will die. And one day you'll get another pastor and you'll still have problems. The world will still have problems. This community will still have problems. However, Christians, while they're here, we say, God, would you give us a little bit of heaven on earth right now? Because your kingdom citizens are living according to your kingdom mandate right here in this moment. Would you give us a little bit of that communion? Would you give us a little bit of that beauty? Would you give us a little bit of that awesomeness right here, right now? And we realize that whatever little bit we get is a foretaste of glory divine. And that's what this is to be. This is what God's church is to be. And I can just say, anybody who tells you they're looking for the next bus out and we hope this old place, that's not at all the vision. If God sought to redeem this world, then his agents who have been bought through his redemption are to work redemptively in his world until he comes. Because when he does break the sky, may he find us faithful. And so I just pray that you're really hearing what I'm saying. I think our culture needs an eternal shaking to shake us out of trivialities, to shake us out of just nothing wrong with recreation. I plan on doing some of it over the summer. But to shake us out of this and say there is a world to come. There is a God in heaven. There is a judgment that will be. And your life today matters and maybe matters more than you could ever imagine that it matters. And so wake up and serve King Jesus. Uh, that is, I can't imagine, the message of this final chapter.
If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you say, how do I get all the spiritual blessings in Christ? Through faith in Jesus. By saying, God, I admit I'm a sinner, and by faith I trust in Jesus. And for those of you who are Christians, are you so earthly-minded you know heavenly good? You know good for God's kingdom because you're doing everything else. Maybe even in this time of invitation, say, God, reorder my priorities so that I can serve you and your kingdom in a more faithful way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you. We ask you to help us, to be with us, to guide us, to direct us. God, we thank you that you love us and that, God, you have more for us than we could ever imagine. God, as we glimpse it, we're moved. As we hear it sung in songs, we know it to be true. And so, God, focus us in this world. God, may we see that whatever human promise can happen in this world, God, you've promised. Greater than that, greater things are yet to come. And God, just stir in our hearts. Speak to our spirits. May we leave from this place praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we long for the day you make all things new. Amen. Let's stand together.